the rest of us, if you turn down your Bibles to Matthew 6, Matthew 6, I think it's uh, page 811 uh, in your pew Bibles, and we'll be uh, beginning with verse 24. And I do want to make mention to a couple of special guests. So they probably don't want to be embarrassed, but we're going to pray for y'all since you're here. First of all, Don Clements, your former pastor, is here with Esther. So we've been praying a lot for you all and, and glad, you, glad you're here with us this morning. And then also, there's Pastor David Cummings with your, his wife, I think, and I didn't get to get your name, but we're glad to have them here as well. And David is the pastor at Sandlick Presbyterian down in Dickinson uh, County, on the, sort of on the border of West Virginia, if I remember correctly. And they've been building a church there, uh, or Christ has been building it through them, and um, our deacons helped them a little bit, sent them some money. They built the building all themselves, right? Your congregation did the building. You couldn't do that in Blacksburg, too many building codes. But we're, we're thankful for your ministry there in a really needy area, and glad that you're here this morning with us. And apparently, Andy Wood is there preaching this morning, and so that's, that enables you to be with us. So we're glad to have all of you. So let's, let's read Matthew chapter 6, and here are the words of our Lord Jesus here in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. Beginning with verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single cubit to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. This is the word of the Lord. Our God and Father, I just pray that you would help us to, uh, to be comforted by the words of our Lord Jesus, who is God, and yet also our friend, who knows what we go through and yet provides for us. Lord, help us to trust him more uh, because we came. Do this for your glory, we pray, and in Christ's name, amen. So, as you know, it's almost New Year, and I wonder how many of you are going to make uh, resolutions. I make resolutions about every third year or so because I'm so bad at keeping them, uh, and so I kind of give up about two out of three years. This coming year... I'd like to uh, read more, write more, pray more, and maybe paint more. Uh, all of those things are time away from screens, if, if you were looking for a theme. But what if we made this a resolution for this coming year? Do not worry. Do not worry. After all, that's what Jesus says. Look at verse 34. He says, therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow's got enough to worry about itself. Sufficient thereof is the evil of the day. And so we could come to 2019 and all determine just to say, we're not going to worry. I wonder how many of us, how well that would go for us. After all, a lot of us have things that we're anxious about. Will we make ends meet? Will my health hold up? Where will I even be? A lot of you don't know where you're going to be a year from now. 
Maybe you're worried about the state of your marriage. I mean, this is real stuff. Marriage is hard and you're worried about it. Or maybe some of you want to be married and you wonder, will you ever meet the right person? Some of you worry about your kids, especially those that maybe the kids have moved away and you can't pretend like you control them anymore. Or you worry about your parents. You're worried about getting your work done. Will you get it all done? It just feels like it never ends or that your schedule is too crowded. And beyond the personal, maybe your personal life is going well. Well, if that's the case, just turn on the news, and that will give you something to worry about. And if you're not worried about our nation and its political situation, then think about Kurdistan, or being a Christian in China, or in North Korea. And of course, one of the problems with 24-hour news and social media is that local stories become national stories. And we begin to worry about things that really don't affect us. And really, that's all that they have to talk about. And so the news and the media tells you to worry all the time. Because if you didn't, you wouldn't turn into their programs and they would stop making money off of you. And they forget to tell you, by the way, statistically, the world is much better off than it was 50 years ago. There's much less poverty and disease and violence But that doesn't make money, so they don't tell you that. But anxiety is a real thing as all these different pressures bear down on us. And if you're like me, one is okay. It's when two or three start to pile up and you have to multitask your worry that things start to get bad. Well, in our text, your greatest friend, Jesus, commands you not to worry. Look at verse 25. He says, Three different times, he says, where is this? Verse 25, he says, uh, and I've lost it already. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. That's a command. Then verse 31, he says, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we wear? Then down again in verse 34, don't worry about tomorrow. Now, two things must be said right off about this command. First of all, we shouldn't suppose that Jesus is advocating a a lazier, carefree life, right? After all, the Bible condemns the philosophy that says, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. That's the philosophy of existentialists that have no hope, that basically say there is no meaning to life, so just kind of enjoy life at the moment. And so there's some folks like this that seem so happy and carefree, but really there's no depth to them. There's no soul for them. They're not really living for anything, And anyway, they wouldn't like heaven anyway because there's nothing in heaven that would interest them. The things of love and holiness and knowing God forever. And so clearly Jesus is not advocating that kind of carelessness. He's not advocating the the mindless song uh, that was a kind of a hit about 20 years ago or 30 years ago, Don't Worry, Be Happy. Do you remember that song by Bobby Farron? I first remember that song, I heard it on a, a fish sang it on a wall. I pushed a button and a fish, what, what was that silly fish? Uh, anyway, you know this song. It says, in life, we have some trouble. When you worry, you make it double. Don't worry, be happy. Ain't got no place to lay your head. Somebody came and took your bed. Don't worry, be happy. The landlord says your rent is late. He may have to litigate. Don't worry, be happy. And the problem with that is he never tells you why you don't have to worry. It's kind of fun, but it's mindless. But our Lord Jesus tells us why we don't have to worry. So the second thing that must be said about this text before we look at it is that it is a command from Jesus. But I don't think it would do you much good for me just to stand up here like that song and just repeat it and just beat up on you all and say, stop worrying, right? I mean, we already have anxiety. And so if I come to you and tell you just to stop worrying, that's like, you know, when you're upset and someone just tells you to chill out, that doesn't really help because there's a reason why you're upset. I mean, one of our worries, isn't it, is that we don't obey God enough that we are not as productive or as peaceful as we're supposed to be. And so for me just to stay up here and yell at you to stop worrying just adds to your anxieties. No, we need to see why Jesus tells us to stop worrying. And what we find as we do that is it's not so much a command as it is a way of life that basks in the gospel. You see that? As we understand the gospel, 
more and more in what Jesus has done for us, then the byproduct of that is a life of not being anxious. And then when we are anxious, we take that anxiety to the foot of the cross and we let God remove it from us. So, so why? what does Jesus, let's look at this, what does Jesus command us not to worry about? Look at verse 25 again. It's amazing. He tells us, don't worry about what you will eat or what you will drink. Are you getting me water? Thank you. I've got water. It's just the throat. It's just going to have to. It's not, it's not associate pastor Sunday. It's raspy throat pastor Sunday. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you for your love. Um, it says, don't worry about what you'll eat or what you will drink. And this is, how is this possible? I mean, these are necessities. We could understand this if Jesus was saying this about uh, luxuries, right? Don't worry about your tanning beds or your caviar, your 60-inch TVs. So this, this seems to be a very demanding commandment. But look at Jesus' reasoning. Look at verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap. They don't, they don't collect into barns, and yet your heavenly Father provides for them. Now, they are working, right? They are getting, getting food. They're, they're out collecting worms and stuff, just like us every day. But they're not worrying about it. And so Jesus is arguing from the lesser to the greater. Are you not more valuable than birds? And then he continues in verse 28 and 30. He says, are you anxious about your clothing? You know, God providing for your material needs. And then he says, consider the lilies of the field. They don't toil nor spin. Yet not even Solomon was arrayed as gloriously as them. I mean, think for us, we never saw Solomon, but think if you happen to see the Queen of England's Christmas speech the other day, uh, and you saw the glories of her palace arrayed behind her. Jesus is saying even the grandeur of the royal house of Great Britain cannot compare to flowers. I mean, we can make some handsome works of art, but nothing compares to God's nature. And so just contemplating the beauty of nature, believe it or not, helps reduce our anxiety. If you don't believe this is a beautiful world still, despite the fall into sin, here's what I ask, invite you to do. Go to Google Maps sometime. So get a little screen time. Go to Google Maps. Blow it up so all you can see is the whole world. Take that little yellow guy, the street view, and plop him down anywhere anywhere in the world, and you'll be amazed at how beautiful whatever pops up. You can do it in the middle of Kazakhstan, in some beautiful spot shows up, the middle of the Congo, some beautiful thing, the middle of Europe, even the middle, the Midwest America, some beautiful spot shows up. I'm not a big fan of the Midwest. <laughs> I found out later that the reason that happens is that they've contracted with tour, tourism guides that have, anyway, they'd always bring you to a beautiful spot, but it's still a fun thing to do. So this is why if you suffer from anxiety or stress, time outside is so wonderful, so valuable. And I think it's in ways that we, we can't really measure. There are, of course, medical reasons for it, getting away. There, there's been studies about screens doing damage to your brain waves and just getting outside and what is it, getting the vitamin D or all that good stuff. I understand that, but I think there's some theological reasons to it as well. You, you see the birds flying and singing. You see the flowers blooming, and it's calming even if you don't know why. I did that this summer when, when I had Lyme disease. I, I like to walk. I like to hike, but I couldn't do it this summer uh, with my arthritis. And so I just went down sometimes in our, our porch area uh, underneath our, our deck, and there are beautiful orange daylilies that were planted all around, and the hummingbirds would come. Uh, and, 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 and there was something just very calm about getting away from the news, getting away from email, getting away from texting, all that stuff, and just sitting in God's nature. Why? Because I'm seeing how God is providing for these lesser creatures. And I think that just infiltrates into us in ways that we can't even understand. You see, Jesus is saying, if God takes care of creatures like this, how much more so will he care for his people? 
All of those who have put their trust in him, who are part of the new creation, who've been born again because they've heard about the good news of God himself invading this world and they've latched themselves on to him, not by their works, but by faith. And if, if you have that, then of course God is going to give all of your needs to you. Is not life worth more than food and the body more than clothes, Jesus says. So if God is the one who gave you your life by grace, you didn't ask to be born. And then you've been born again, and we know that also is by God's will, not the will of flesh. So will he not then give you everything you need until he brings you home? Now, immediately, a question comes to mind as you do listen to the news and you hear about persecuted Christians in Syria or Nigeria or China, and you say, is, are, do Christians never go hungry? Are they never killed? Are they never? Of course they are. That's why we have the book of Acts where there's the, the first, one of the first great deacons, Stephen. The whole, he gets a whole chapter of being martyred. Then this Sunday across the church, across the world, many churches are celebrating the, the feast of the holy innocents, those children that were slaughtered in Bethlehem. But the point is, is that all of these things are under God's loving care. And for those that are in Christ, he has far greater rewards for them in heaven. So even when God allows us a time of suffering, worrying, whether you know what's going on or not, worrying about it is not going to do you any good. We may not know why we're going through it, but worrying doesn't help at all. I mean, that's what Jesus says, verse 27. But if you are anxious, can you add a single hour? Or the Greek here is cubit, right? What is a cubit? It's, it's actually half a yardstick. I was looking for a yardstick to show you how long it was, and I, I found a half a yardstick. Perfect, 18 inches. So just think, how many of you would like to be 18 inches taller? Cal Ribbons is like, no, I'm good. <laughs> Thanks. Some of us wouldn't mind, you know. But if I worry about my five, six, I'm actually five seven on a good day, but if I worry about being five six and a half, and I'm just like worrying about it, and I stick, am I, can I get taller? by saying, I wish I was taller? It doesn't work. So the same thing with your life. If God is in control of your height, he has set every day of your life before you. And worrying about it cannot add a day. It can't add an hour. It can't add 18 inches to your life. And neither, by the way, can positive thinking. The point is, is God's providence is set. His plan for us is predetermined. And, and that gives us comfort because of these two great facts. God is all-powerful, and God is all-loving. And if you are in Christ, his love for you is secured by the cross. And so the same God who gave you life and gave you eternal life will take care of you until he takes you home. That is guaranteed. Now, you may not get everything you want until he takes you home, but the promise of Scripture is you will get everything you need for life and godliness. And all as determined by God's perfect plan and his perfect love for you. He can't love you any more than he does if you've trusted him through Christ. And so his plan is perfect. You will live forever because your sins are forgiven by the blood of Christ. If he's given you that, what else won't he give you? That's what Romans 8 is all about. This is why Paul also wrote what he does in Colossians 3 when we think about where to focus our mind. He says, if you have been raised with Christ, which you have, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not things that are on earth. It doesn't mean you can't think about what you're going to cook for lunch or what job you should take or how, what, you know, what tie to wear. But he's saying, make your focus the things that matter most, the things of heaven. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. If you don't think you look like a lily now, you will then. You will be clothed in glory. That's the promise of the gospel. And so think of that when you read Matthew 6 and 25, when he says, don't be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink. You're headed to a better place. This life is nothing compared to the life we will receive when Christ returns and makes all things new. And so it re 
prioritizes everything we're after in this life. And it causes us to trust God. It's, we learn to trust our Lord like children trust their parents. It's why Jesus said, unless you become like a little child, you shall not enter the kingdom of God. Or what David says in Psalm 131, O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me, but I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. So that's the picture of a little child resting against his or her mother's breast, weaned, not clingy, not needy, but at peace. And this is what I mean then, that the command to not worry is not so much a command, but a reminder to bask in the gospel, to trust God's goodness. And so you say, is that it? It's not don't worry, be happy. It's just don't worry, be faithful. Well, yes and no. That's a summary. But there, there's something going on more here. Look down to verse 31 and 32. He says, all right, don't be anxious. He's kind of repeating himself. Verse, you see how 31 is a repeat of verse 25, but now he gives a further interpretation. Verse 32, for the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them. So why is he bringing up Gentiles? The word here is, is ethnic. It means the nations. But in this context, it means those that, that don't yet know the gospel, outsiders. Uh, so that's why the NIV translates it as pagans. And the point is, is that material well-being is all that they know, right? That's why their motto in life is, they who die with the most toys wins. Because they don't live for the afterlife. Oh, yes, worldlings who dominate our society, by the way, on all sides of the spectrum, whether Wall Street or Hollywood, we're constantly being bombarded by what worldlings think. They may give lip service to the afterlife, but they're really all about this world. That's all that matters to them. It's the only thing they live for. And so, therefore, that's all they're doing. So Jesus is saying, don't just be like a pagan. Show that you're headed to a better place. And that's why he begins this whole passage in verse 25 with that phrase, therefore. What is it there for? That's the ante it's referring to verse 24, which we did not read the antecedent where he says, no one can serve two masters. You'll either be devoted to the one and despise the other. You, and then he just interprets that in case you're wondering which two masters. You cannot serve God and money. And here money represents everything that the world can give us. All materialism put into that, to that, that power component that we call money. And that's all that worldlings have. It's what they worship. And that's why the world wants us to be worried all the time about having more money, because that's all they worry about. That's all they live for. They don't know that there's eternal life, that, 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 that God's love is upon them forever in Christ if they trust him. And so they want that to spread to us. They want us to be worried and upset all the time like them. And that's why the news is obsessed with politics because that's all they know. And that can spread to us and spread into the church. And I confess, sometimes it does to me as well. Or they say, if you're not gonna be obsessed with these things, then just get drunk, deaden your feelings with, with, with more goods, materialism, more entertainment or pills so that we don't feel the pain of being disappointed. And so Jesus tells us not to be like them. Don't be frantic and anxious about the things of this world. Our God provides all our needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And so that then leads us to the crux of the passage. Here's the goal for 2019. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We are to seek God's approval first. And the good news is this, we already have his approval if you are in Christ. That's why the author of Ecclesiastes says in Ecclesiastes 9, go, he says, drink your wine with joy, do your work with all of your might, for God has already approved your works. 
because of the merits of Christ. And so we don't have to be anxious to please God either. We simply trust in his grace for us through Christ. And so if God has taken care of our primary problem, which is condemnation by our own sin and guilt, if he's taken care of that, will he not take care of everything else we need? That's why, like Paul, we can learn the secret of being content in all circumstances, whether in plenty or in want. And that's why Jesus promises in verse 33 that if we're seeking God's kingdom first, his, his righteousness, which is ours through Christ, then all these things will be added unto you. They're just gravy that he gives you. And then you're free to enjoy the things of this life. We don't become ascetic monks and just say, well, we're only about spiritual things. And there, No, we already have the spiritual things in Christ. And so then when we get something good to eat or something good to drink or some painting to paint or some sporting event to play with all our hearts, we do it and we enjoy them because they're gravy that God gives us on top of his grace. And then sometimes we also realize that what we need most, if we're seeking God's kingdom first, then what we need most is not some blessing, but some trial to cause us to grow in godliness so that we can be a blessing to others, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1, right? And so then we aren't happy about those trials. They're not fun, but we accept them with peace. Our God is true and will work out all things together for our good. But sometimes we don't see it while we're going through it. All right, let me give you a, a small example. A few summers ago, I was, I was playing soccer. And um, we were playing in the summer, just kind of a, a pickup game. I think it was Tuesdays and Thursdays, if I remember correctly. Digby joined us and his family. And uh, one summer, I started wearing cleats. And I was amazed at how good I'd gotten all of a sudden with wearing cleats. But it was kind of doing, kind of hurting my, my tendons a little bit, and I kind of ignored it. Well, one time I was playing like center de defender, uh, sweeper, I guess, and, and uh, Daryl Cook, who many of you know is a faithful minister here in town for years, works with the Baptist uh, Student Ministries, he just, he just came barreling into me. Like, I don't think he understood in soccer you're, you're supposed to stop before you hit someone else. Like, you're supposed to kick the ball first. And he, whenever I see him, I always tease him about this. So he barreled into me. And I collapsed into the ground and broke my rib. So whenever I see him, I say, hey, Daryl, good to see you again. Thanks for breaking my rib, right? He always talks about this. But actually, technically, he didn't break my rib. The, the ground broke my rib. So you need to give him a little grace. And so I had to stop playing soccer that summer. And I whined and belly ached about it. And it took several weeks for my rib to heal. But meanwhile, my tendons weren't really healing up. And so when I finally went to the doctor about my tendons, he said, it's a good thing you stopped playing because had you kept playing in cleats, which you are not used to at your, in your middle age, being out of shape like you were, you would have probably torn them and it would have taken years for them to heal. So I didn't like that Daryl broke my rib, but he did me a favor. He kept me from getting hurt worse. And so when bad things happen to us, they're not fun to go through, but we trust that God has a good purpose for each of them. He died for us. Will he not take care of us? Will he not use those trials to provide for us and grant us even greater blessing, which is a greater godliness as we learn to trust him? And so we move on, and so we learn then that we don't live for money, and just quickly, we don't have time to get into all of this, but because then we are trusting God to provide for us, it keeps us from doing dishonest things and, and cheating and, 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 and taking short corners, because if you do those things, if all you care about is this world and, and not the next world, then you are tempted to just do things ethically that provide for you here and now, but because we trust God to take care of us, Therefore, we live godly lives that are ethical and honest and open and true and don't live for money. That's where we read the book of Proverbs. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not rely on your own insight, your own tricky ways. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He will make your path straight. So are you worried about 2019? Are you worried about where you're going to be? Make this your goal, verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, 
and all those things you're worried about will be given to you if you need them. And if instead he gives you trial, then those are the things you need as well. And anything you don't get done, any resolution you make that's not accomplished, yet if you are seeking God's kingdom first, then you're getting the things done that need to get done, even if they're small. That's why I love the third verse of the hymn we're about to sing. Lord, if your will is to put me in a corner, in a tiny place, if you are glorified, then that's what I want. It doesn't matter what the world thinks. It doesn't matter how many followers you have. It doesn't matter who notices or not. Your Lord knows, and you're living for him and not unto men. And that's why then Jesus finally closes, verse 34. So with all these things, don't be anxious about tomorrow. If God's taking care of you today, so he will take care of you tomorrow. That's why we pray the prayer Jesus taught us when you say, give us this day what? Our daily bread. If we could, look, if I could stand up here tonight, today and say, we're going to say the Lord's prayer, but instead of saying daily, we're going to say yearly bread, Right? If I could tell you, God, I know we don't have to pray anymore, then we're done for the year seeking the Lord. And what we've done is we've gotten our needs taken care of. We've prayed for a year's amount of bread, but we're not getting to know God anymore. You see, what our Lord wants is not so much to provide for us, but to be our friend, to know us, to love us, and that we would know and love him back. That's what matters far more than anything you're being provided for is knowing and loving God and Christ who is your life. That's why we pray for our daily bread and the very next day we do the same thing. When I was in the army and you couldn't end a year without an army story at Grace Covenant. And I may have told this story before, I'm sure I have, but when I was, we, my, my wife and I had just gotten married and Saddam invaded Kuwait and we knew my unit, we knew we were going off to war. I mean, all our tanks were already painted desert brown, so we knew we were going off. And I was, I was worried. I knew we were going into combat. I knew we were facing the fourth largest army in the world with chemical weapons. And I was scared. And so I went to the chaplain, a dear brother in Christ, and I said to him, I don't know that I'm going to do well when it comes to combat. I don't know that I'll do my job. I don't know that I'll stand firm. How can I know God will provide for me? He says, God doesn't promise you now that you're going to be okay. He just promises to take you through the day today. And when the time comes, when you need it, he'll give you the courage you need but you can't store it up because he wants you to keep seeking him day after day after day. That's why Jesus tells us, so you look at 2019, if you're like me, you want everything in place, you want it all set, you want to know it's going to, but Jesus says, don't be anxious about tomorrow. Tomorrow's got enough troubles. You follow me today. And you wake up tomorrow, you do the same thing. You wake up the next day, you do the same thing. And as you do that, however your year turns out, wherever you end up, however much money you end up having, you're going to know God better. And you're going to have more of Christ because you've been seeking him every day. That's what matters. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the family that you've made us in Christ. And thank you that you care for us, that even as you provide for the birds and the flowers, so you care for us. And we would bring our anxious thoughts to you now. We would ask for you to still them, that you would help us to trust you with whatever is is causing us disquiet. And more than that, help, Lord, help us to be more godly. Help us to seek you more not just worry about getting entertained or getting our way, but really to seek your kingdom and your righteousness in our hearts and in this church and across your church. And we pray these things all in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.